Amen. Lift up your head, you who have been pain and inheritance in the Son. The Lord has been gracious to you. He's forgiven you your sins through Jesus. Hear this declaration of grace from Proverbs 28. Whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always. If you would please stand as we continue in worship, singing, Come, O Sinner. to come forward um, it is our great delight and privilege to have Mateo join into our membership here at Faith Covenant. As a member of the body of Christ, that always is lived out in the body of Christ in a small local church. And here we have that before us with Mateo. And as always, we ask questions of Mateo, just simple membership questions that we believe any Christian should be able to answer in the affirmative, and then a response given by the congregation as well. All right. Mateo, do you understand yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure without hope except for his sovereign mercy? Yes. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you trust and receive in him alone for salvation as he's offered you in the gospel? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you endeavor to live as becomes a follower of Jesus Christ? Yes. Do you promise to support the church and her worship and her work to the best of your ability? Yes. Do you submit yourself to the government and the discipline of the church and promise to strive for her purity and for her peace? I do. And do you, the members of Faith Covenant Church, you promise to accept Mateo Lopez into our membership to support and to encourage him, to pray for him, to share the fellowship of Christ with him 
in order to fulfill Christ's law of love in bearing with his burdens? If so, you are members. You raise your right hand and simply say, I do. I do. I do indeed. All right. Welcome, Mateo. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Encourage you afterwards to find Mateo. Just to talk with him if you don't know him. And just, yeah, a delightful brother to be able to hear the, the grace of God and his testimony in his life. So please find him after the services. We are able to go downstairs for some fellowship at the same time. As the ushers then come forward and we prepare for our offering, just take out the attendance treasure, fill it out, and send it to the person next to you. That would be most appreciated by us in the office. And children ages four to six can also be dismissed to Children's Church at this time. Please join me in prayer for our offering today. Lord God, we do thank you for all the gifts that you give to us in our daily provision. Father, thank you for the good gifts that you bring to us, Lord, and new members. Father, you have blessed all of us with gifts. You've blessed all of us with needs. And we see how these things correspond one to the other. Lord, thank you that you supply all of these things for us. And so we ask that it would please you to bless us just giving in our tithes and our offerings. Lord, that freely as we have received from you, we ask, Lord, that we would also be able to freely give back to you. And this we pray and ask through Christ our Lord. Amen.
you please remain standing for our prayer and the reading of God's word. We continue in Romans 9, tracing Paul's thoughts about the God who keeps his promises to his people. You join me in prayer for the reading of God's word. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from your mouth. So we ask that this morning you would make us hungry for this heavenly food that would nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. We ask this through Jesus Christ, who is the bread of heaven. Amen. We're looking at verses 14 to 29, simply starting with the first few verses. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who, is, who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, that I might show my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. And you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will it is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? The word of the Lord. If you please be seated. There's no doubt Romans 9 is one of those poke you in the eye kind of chapters. There are many who have taken offense at what the Apostle Paul has given to us here. And to state uh, the obvious but not so obvious, the Bible is a radically God-centered book. Now, you think that's obvious, but we live in a very radically me-centered culture. And it's easy then to still use the Bible to be all about me. To be indifferent about the things of God and to sprinkle a little religion here or there uh, as the quality of my own life could improve. Jesus becomes the spare tire. I take him out when things aren't going very well just to get me out of a tough spot. God becomes the concierge. He's supposed to arrange my life uh, and assist me along the way. And then prayer becomes a means of getting my best life now. It's all very me-focused in the culture in which we live. Years ago, a man, he came to me to see me because his wife was about to divorce him and she had biblical reasons to do so. And he became very religious for a few weeks. He was sure that when Jesus said, ask, seek, and knock, that it meant that God would keep his wife from leaving him. It didn't. And then he gave up on God because he didn't get what he prayed for. Coming to worship was just a way to get God to answer his prayers. Very me-focused. The book of James were reminded, it says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. That self-focus. And here in chapter 9, Paul perform, performs a self-ectomy on all of us. From the opening lines of Genesis 1, where we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, all the way to the closing remarks in the book of Revelation, the very last book. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The Bible is a self-revelation of our triune God. The Father showcasing His Son in human history through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Paul tells us as plain as day, salvation is a gift from God. It's not a birthright. It's not something you earn. It's not something you deserve. And then, knowing fallen human nature, Paul anticipates the objection. Wait a minute. It's not fair. God is unjust. And in this objection, I know you've heard it all the time as well, it seems that it's almost always given to those who, who take up this objection in the abstract or for someone else. Now, once in a while, you might run into a real Shylock who demands that he gets what he deserves. But most of you here probably know better than that. That's foolish. You're not going to ask God, give me what I deserve. But what we do demand is God's grace and mercy. God acts consistently according to his righteous character. And all those that he has chosen in his son receive the fullness of the son's redemption. And those who reject the son, they get what they deserve. 
And as we saw last week, once more on display is this antinomy, this seeming paradox of bringing together God's sovereignty and human responsibility. And once again, we see that our God is more than up to the task to bring these together, even if it's well beyond our own understanding, as are many things in the world around us. Well, looking then at the two objections Paul addresses, first, he says, one, is God unjust? And that's immediately, what shall we say then? Is there injustice in God? And he says, by no means. There's no hesitation. Paul says, God acts faithfully. And then he quotes from the book of Exodus. He says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Now, the context of this is that this is right after Israel has completely blown it with the whole golden calf fiasco. Here they have been rescued by God. He called them to himself, and he's giving the, the covenant to Moses, and down below they're just running amok. There are no innocents who are just minding their own business, and God comes along and decides to whop them. No, they're in complete and open rebellion against God. And he grants them mercy. And Paul says, so it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God, who has mercy. It's really clear. No sinner earns or deserves mercy. It is a gift. And, and then Paul brings another scripture from, from Exodus. Now, in the book of Romans, it's the most quotes you've received in the Old Testament in one letter from Paul. And the vast majority of them here in these three chapters when Paul is, is dealing with, with Jewish heirs, he's quick to use Scripture to support what he's saying. So again, from Exodus. For Scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up, that I might show my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whoever he wills, and he hardens whoever he wills. Now, the first mention of God hardening Pharaoh's heart, it comes back in Exodus 4. God told Moses that he would perform great miracles through him. And then he says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not let my people go. And it's this that often sends people into a tailspin. Or a search to see, well, who hardened whose heart first? Was it Pharaoh or was it God? How did this work out? Sorry, Han shot first. <laughs> God starts in Exodus 4. I will harden his heart. But I appreciate what New Testament scholar Christopher Ash reminds us. It's in your bulletin. He said, when God hardens someone, he doesn't change them from neutral or innocent to guilty. He hands them over to the consequences of their own sin. Pharaoh's not a neutral character. He's a wicked man killing Israelite babies, oppressing the rest of them, tyrannical slavery. All of humanity has fallen. There's no position of neutrality. I really appreciate... American theologian Jonathan Edwards, I think he really makes a, a great contribution in understanding this, this issue of free will. And for him, he expressed it this way, you get what you want, then you're free. Freedom is not whether you can have choice A or choice B, that is immensely complex. No choice is ever just this one or this one. There's so much that's tied to it. He, he says, did you get what you want? Pharaoh got what he wanted. He wasn't this nice guy trying to bless Israel, but God forced him to be mean. No one compels you to sin. If you're behind a car that won't turn right on red, no one compels you to get mad about it. Not like, oh, I can't control my anger and rage. If it's a police cruiser in front of you, you control it really well. <laughs> There's no honking on the horn and giving him gestures. You control that really well. Say that it overwhelmed me. No, you allowed it to overwhelm you. You had a choice in the matter. And Paul is telling us that mercy is a gift given by a good and gracious God. And some have this idea that God is sort of like that Batman supervillain Harvey Dent, referred to as two-faced. Half his face is scarred, and the other half is okay, and he has this double-headed coin, and he flips it to decide which part of his personality is going to emerge, the nice guy or the villain, all based on an arbitrary flip of a coin. Well, that's not our holy God. He acts according to his faithful and righteous nature. There is not an arbitrary 
or an abstract act in all of this. Now, many want to be hypothetically upset with God. It's as if some were saying, you know, if the end of Flat Lake was all dammed up, our property would be underwater and there'd be no value to it. We wouldn't be paying all the high real estate prices. Okay. It's not dammed up. It has nothing to do with the current prices, is it? Well, it could. It's not. <laughs> You know, you've had those conversations. I know you've had with people who get very upset about these hypothetical thoughts. They might be interesting to consider, but they're hypothetical. So many treat Romans 9 in this way. There are objections about what is not being said or what's not the case. See, the idea is you consider yourself, not the person around the world who you think has never had an opportunity to hear about Jesus. The judge of all the earth will do right. You will stand before God for you, not for them. Have you rejected God's free offer of Jesus? If so, there's no complaining about getting the consequences of that. We repeatedly see this in Scripture. The Lord is extending patience. He does not turn away anyone who seeks Him. And here, Paul anticipates the next objection. Why am I accountable? You will say to me, why does he find fault? For who can resist his will? So this objector, rather than in humility repenting from his sins, is blaming God for them. Notice that Paul does not pull out some defense using human free will. If you're going to do that, this would be the place to do it. But he actually goes in the opposite direction. He quotes first from the book of Job and then from the prophet Isaiah. He says, who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Well, what is molded say to us molder? Why have you made me like this? Has a potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honor and one for dishonor? What if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, has endured with much patience the vessel of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of the glory for vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory? Again, there's no one neutral here. No innocent people. He's already leveled the playing fields. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And he goes on. Even us whom he called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Paul, he's drawing all the strings of his argument together. God's been faithful to his promises. These promises were not for religious unbelievers, but for the remnant that he's preserved, which includes Jews and Gentiles. Paul, he recasts in the book of Hosea to speak about the righteous remnant that includes more than just Israel. He says in verse 25, indeed, as Hosea says, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And who who is not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it's said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Uh, this is the good news of Jesus. As I said last week, I mentioned Carl Barth, he spoke of, when we talk about election, we need to acknowledge that Jesus Christ as both the electing God and the elected man. All of this selecting and choosing, it narrowed all the way down through human history to one individual, to Jesus, the God man. And because of this, there's now a widening that moves out away from him that includes not only just one group of people, but all those who were bypassed in the direct line of the Messiah that he mentioned last week, Ishmael, Esau, all the Gentiles. There is a remnant now that has been included by the sovereign mercy of God. And what that means, at least in the, the early church that Paul's talking to, there's no room for any Jewish Christian looking down on anyone else as a second-class citizen in Christ. And there's no room for a Gentile Christian looking down on any Jewish Christian as some sort of has-been that doesn't matter. Both are a part of the Messiah's remnant. Because all of their choosing and election is founded in the person and work of Jesus and that we are in Christ. And Paul goes on. He says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be of the sand of the sea, just 
countless. Only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out on his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And then in verse 29 he ends. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have become like Sodom. We would have become like Gomorrah. Now, no doubt, God's sovereignty can cause us some uneasiness, to be sure. And yet, Paul brings this out to encourage and to strengthen our faith. He gives us great assurance. Now, you've heard me quote this before from, from Mike Mason. He's the author of The Gospel According to Job. And he's talking about suffering. But he says, we Christians do not like to think about being absolutely helpless in the hands of our God. When difficulties arise, we like to think that there are certain steps we can take, attitudes we can adopt, to alleviate our anguish and be happy. In fact, there's absolutely nothing either we or someone else can do to better our situation. Only the Lord himself can do that. And admittedly, there's something terrifying about that. And, and we want to think that somehow we can do something to move us out of that category. This helplessness is humbling and it tests our faith. And it's not simply true of our suffering, it's also true of our limited understanding. From, from John Stott, if therefore anybody is lost, the blame is theirs. But if anybody saved, the credit is God's. This antinomy contains a mystery which our present knowledge cannot solve, but it's consistent with Scripture, history, and experience. And we, we understand that. We understand there are many things that are above our pay grade that often people get upset about. They want a God big enough to handle all their problems, but somehow they can wrap their arms around and have an explanation of and, and, and understand. I want it big enough that I can be mad at him if I don't understand something. Nope. We're finite creatures. There are many things in this world that you and I have no clue an understanding of. One writer, James Denny, he's century ago. He was a Scottish theologian. He was lecturing on this very theme. And an impertinent student put up his hand and asked the question, Professor Denny, there were some things in your lecture about the divine purpose and about the divine sovereignty that I didn't understand. And Denny said to him very quietly, young man, since the lecture was about Almighty God, and you're one of his very young and very small creatures. I'm not surprised that there were some things that you didn't understand. The hubris that's there, as if you have to give an account to me. Here again, John Calvin on his chapter on predestination, he put it really well. He said, the best rule of sobriety is not only in learning to follow wherever God leads, but when God makes an end of his teaching, we cease wishing to be wise. When God's done teaching, we're done learning. And that's a part of what it means for the finite creature to bow before the infinite. And I think one of the greatest struggles that we have, it's usually that we're just not profoundly aware of our own sinfulness and God's holiness. If you've been a Christian long enough, you can probably look back and see a time or two when this has happened to you, where there's just an overwhelming sense of the presence of God, His holiness, the awesomeness of His majesty. And it's, I don't think it's the normal experience for most of God's people, but those moments when that just you've just been laid out. And if you've experienced this, did it move you to revere God, to humility, to repent of your sinfulness, to impress on you the preciousness of God's grace? Or did it move you to a deeper appreciation of the many right choices you've made along the way? 
of how you figured out you needed to follow after Jesus. We know the answer. There's this popular idea that God is in the business of forgiveness and therefore whenever I want forgiveness he has to give it to me. As if God is under an obligation to give us a mandatory gift. No one deserves grace or mercy. These are divine gifts. That's been the whole point. You reject them at your own peril. You receive them at the Lord's initiative. There are many great and wonderful truths of understanding in all of this, but this is not academic wrangling that we're interested in. It's worship of our God that's at stake here to increase our capacity of awe and wonder at his insurpassable glory and majesty. On cosmic display is the fathers revealing the Son through the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And we hear then the Son call out, if anyone would hear my voice. And we also hear the Son say, my sheep know my voice and I will lose none of those the Father has given to me. And both of these things run true. And our indifference towards God, our hostility towards the things we don't understand or, or the abstract hypothetical objections for somebody else, we stand before God with our lives, giving an account for the things that we know. Not for what we think somebody else, they got a good deal or not, it's for you. And that is what we give an account for. And Paul is calling, is saying, who are you, oh man, to talk back to God? We are, are in a state of sin and rebellion, and the response is not one of, God, why did you make me this way? The response is, thank you for the mercy and the grace that you've extended me to your son. That the penalty that I deserve rested upon him. He took what I deserved and he gave me what I don't deserve. That is the good news. That's what gospel means, good news. That's what good news is. I didn't get what I deserved. And the last thing that you want to do is go before the Almighty One and say, give me every penny of what I deserve. In the same way, we do not go before the Almighty and demand His grace and mercy. By definition, grace and mercy are gifts. Well, yeah, but He's in the forgiveness business, so He's got to do it. <laughs> Who are you to tell God what He ought to do? And so as we come to the end of a difficult chapter, there are many things, and many people have written great treatises on this to explain it in far greater detail. But I think by and large, most of us, we simply look in awe of what God has done in our own life. I don't know why he chose to enlighten me to see Jesus. I don't know. I don't know why he, he called you out of darkness and light. I don't know why he extended mercy to you, but he did. And that's, that's what we celebrate. And at the same time, he, he tells us to go forth into the world and to be proclaimers of this good news. We don't just sit by and, well, why does it matter? The, no. If you are now participants in the good news of Jesus going into the world. That's the, 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 how he has designed it. And so you truly get to participate in sharing this news with others and seeing how the Holy Spirit brings an understanding to them through the words of truth that you communicated. That is a good and kind and gracious God. Who when he says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, I'll harden whom I have hardened. And he's speaking this to a group of people who have utterly blown it. And he's extending mercy once more to. And you're going to see that even through their history time and time again. It is his mercy that is extended. Do not spurn the moment of God's mercy in your life. He is not obligated to return back to you. 
He comes to each one of us and says, today, today if you hear my voice, follow me. Pray with me. Father Almighty, as we come before you, we admit we are all very young. We are small creatures. And Father, first and foremost, we say thank you. Thank you that you have not left us in the state of sin and misery, but you have come to set us free. And Lord, we confess there's so much of this we don't fully understand. But Father, thank you. Thank you for the salvation that has been given to us through your Son. Thank you that we have been chosen in him. And Lord, we would ask then that you would be pleased to use us as those who would be proclaimers of this very, very good news to others. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. There is one gospel.
we've heard it, we've felt it at times, that caricature of the God who flips the coin and you get this, you get that. This is not a caricature. This is a God who, in his great patience and forbearance, has given to us his son that we would not receive our just due. This is not arbitrary. This is not capricious. This is kindness on display. Kindness to us who don't fully understand, who often can walk in, in times of great indifference to the things of God. And here he is giving to us one more time, His grace, His mercy in His Son, calling us to Himself that we would have life and have life in abundance in Him. If you somehow think that following God is going to decrease your joy, you do not understand the author and giver of joy. Come to the table to receive again the renewal of the covenant, his grace and mercy given to you as the people of God. You who were once far off, he has called near. You who once did not have a name, he's given a name. Don't worry about the hypotheticals, the arbitrary something else. Bring yourself before the presence of God, receiving his gift of mercy and grace in Jesus this day. As those who are helping the supper come forward, if you would join me in prayer. Father Almighty, you're very big and we're very small. And Father, we thank you that in the largeness of your heart, Lord, that you have given to us your Son, here present to us in bread and wine. Father, his very body, his very blood. Lord, it's a mystery we don't even fully understand. But Father, we thank you that by your spirit that you are transforming your people from glory to glory. We bless you for the goodness that you have given to us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The night that he was betrayed after giving thanks, Lord Jesus took bread, he broke it, and said, this is my body broken for you. Later, he took the cup, and he said, this is the cup of my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Ministering in his name, I would ask then that you also would take the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus to eat and to drink as well. The table is the Lord's table. It is for those who have, in obedience, followed up with baptism in his triune name, professing faith in him. And if you're not sure of this, let the plates pass you by. You are in open rebellion against God to let the place pass you by because then this would actually be a testament of judgment upon you rather than an offering of a gift of grace and come and speak with any of us later love to tell you more about the wonder and the joy of Jesus but brothers and sisters you who belong to Christ receive again his kindness and his mercy anew If you also hold on to the elements that we've all been served, we'll share together at the end. Thank you.
you who are much loved by the Father, the body of his Son broken for you. Take and eat. Blood of Christ, take and drink. bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for calling us here this morning. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit in this church and in our lives. And I pray that you would allow us to see you for who you truly are, that our understanding of you would grow and that your majesty and power would fill our own lives with wonder. I pray that our hearts would desire, would be to be with you and for you and for you alone that we would truly revel in your mercy and rest in the assurance that your mark on our lives brings, Father. And Father, as we pray this, I want to lift up All Souls Church in Missoula. Pray that you would be with that ministry, that they would stay true to your word, that they'd be a light in that community, and that your word would always be preached there. And I also pray that you would be with them as they continue their search for a senior pastor to fill the pulpit there, Father. Father, I want to lift up Braveheart Chaplain Ministries and the work of Drew Buckner and his staff as, as they serve to work with the local law enforcement and the medical community in times of crisis to bring your words and your comfort to those who are in turmoil and loss. Father, we continue to lift up the sick and hurting in our own congregation that you would provide healing and hope. I especially want to lift up Ann Ingram as she recovers from heart surgery and pray that you'd be with them as they travel home from Cincinnati, that you would give them safety and healing for Ann. The same with Todd Cotilla, that you would continue his recuperation, that you would be with him and encourage him in his long journey that he's on, Father. Father, I want to just praise you for the wedding yesterday of Elsa Mickelson to Drew, um, that you would be with that couple, that you would bless that union, that you would bring, be part of their life and their glue together in the coming years and the rest of their life. Father, we thank you for the VBS program in our church this past week, for all the volunteers and the organizers who help teach and love our children well, and specifically to teach our children your truths. Father, we pray that they would have a lasting impact on their lives. Father, I pray for those who are traveling as this is a, a vacation week coming up that you would give people from this congregation traveling and those traveling to this congregation safety, be with them. I also pray that you would provide on either end opportunities for them to worship and praise your holy name. Father, I thank you for Mateo for coming forward for his profession of faith and his willingness to join this church. And I pray that you would watch over him and guide him in his walk and that you would allow us and encourage us to come alongside and encourage him as well. And Father, I pray for all of us here that we would never stop seeking your spirit for guidance and direction in all that we do and all that we think. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Please stand. To God be the glory.
Mind you, if any of you are in need of personal prayer, uh, Elder Tom Jensen will be up front and available to pray with you immediately following the service. We do have a time of fellowship downstairs. You want to join us down there for some coffee and light refreshments. And there is a missions meal that will follow the second service. And that will be for the group that is going to Turkey. So that is going to be around 1130-ish is when that will start. So you can come back for that and uh, hear more about what's happening in Turkey. And as a part of that, we're going to have them come forward just to introduce who, th who that team is going to be. And uh, so I'm going to give the benediction and just sit down qu quickly. And then we'll have them come up and introduce them to you. So receive this benediction from Psalm 20. May the Lord fill you with the joy of your salvation. May the Lord fulfill all of your petitions. May he answer you when you call. May he answer you from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Go forth then in his joy and peace. Indeed. All right.